You may have seen some of his previous works like 2016 Obama's America, Hillary's America, Death of a Nation. Now Dinesh D'Souza is back with a new book and a new film out Friday. It's called Vindicating Trump. And you can learn more at VindicatingTrump.com. Dinesh D'Souza joining me now on the Scott Sand Show. Scott, long time no talk. It's been a while, Dinesh. It's great to have you back on. You you continue to it's really out, fun. Good to yeah. talk to you. You continue to put out movies, man. You, I I I have uh, I don't know if I watch as many movies as you've produced in the last few years. <laughs> well, this this is a really important one, and uh, let's let's talk about it when you're ready. Yeah, uh, vindicating Trump. It's going to be released on Friday, the twenty seventh. Uh, what is this about? Are you looking at, at all of the legal allegations against him? Are you looking at all the accusations of racism and, and all the other tropes that we hear about Donald Trump? You know, it's, it's all in there. Let's put it this way. The, the movie covers four types of assassination. It's not a bad way to put it. There's character assassination. There is political assassination. This would be Russia collusion, the effort to frame Trump as a Russian spy. And then there is lawfare. Now, lawfare that comes out of warfare, so it's legal assassination, trying to lock the guy up for life, and then, of course, actual assassination, now two assassination attempts. So look at the lengths to which the left, the Democrats, the Trump haters will go to try to put this guy out. It's got to be something about him that makes him a very scary guy, and that's what this movie brings out. What is it about Trump that they're fixated on Trump. I mean, you know, no one's trying to assassinate Paul Ryan. Uh, no one's trying to, uh, you know, assassinate Mitt Romney. It's something about Trump. He's the larger-than-life aspect of this guy. And the centerpiece of this film, Scott, is a, is a one-on-one. It's a riveting one-on-one with Trump in which I, I try to bring out a private dimension of the man that is not often seen in the public arena. And I'm happy to say I think I'm able to do that. When, when you say, what is it about the man? I mean, one of the things that, that Corinne Jean- Pierre from the podium or even Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris have all said is that, well, he brings it upon himself by saying outrageous and racist things. Well, this is the point. Uh, you are right, and, and they are right, that there is, a, there is a connection between the character assassination and the actual assassination. But it's, it's not Trump's character assassination. It's the character assassination of Trump. I mean, if you could interview these two guys who, who were trying to kill Trump, I'm sure they would say something like this. You know, Trump is like Hitler circa 1933. Think how great it would have been for the world and for Germany if they had gotten rid of Hitler before he was able to do all the atrocities that he did. I'm a hero because of what I'm trying to do. I have the courage to do what other people will only talk about. Because if Joe Biden says and Kamala Harris says this man is an existential threat to democracy in the country, well, then we should want him taken out. The, you know, it makes no sense to say, in fact, some people will say things like, well, I don't like Trump, but, you know, I like his policies, or he needs to shut his mouth. I make the argument in this film and book that we don't need to rehabilitate Trump. For this crisis that we're facing as a country, he's the right guy. His combination of qualities, good and bad, the mixture of it is essential. It's kind of like saying, you know, you can't go, you couldn't go to Lincoln in, in the Civil War and say, you know, you got to pull General Grant out from the fighting because, you know what, he's a bum. He uses all kinds of bad language. He bankrupted his father's store. He cusses a lot. He, he's an alcoholic. Lincoln would be like, who cares? If you want the Union armies to win, he's our guy. That's the case I'm making for Trump, that in this situation, he's the right, he's not just the right guy, he's maybe the only guy. Well, and I mean, he's almost 80 years old. You're not going to change a man at, at this age, at this point. You might, you might be able to get him to tone down. He's an entertainer. He certainly knows how to present himself in public. But you're not going to change who he is at his core. And, and that's what so many Americans fell in love with about Donald Trump in 2015, 2016. He's, he's a bit of a stand-up comedian. I mean, who says the phrase dictator for a day? I mean, that's just, that's the kind of thing that comes out of a stand-up comedian. And, and yet Trump knows it's going to rile the other side. Uh, and that's why he says it. That's why he puts out memes that are like Trump 24, Trump 28, Trump 32. So he knows how to gall the other side. That's for sure. But, you know, if you take a little more sober look and ask the question, hey, listen, you keep saying Trump's going to be a, you know, a dictator. Well, he was in office. And, what dictatorial things did he do? How many, how many leading Democrats did he lock up? 
Well, none. You, none. You, but I, but you would say some some of his critics would claim that January sixth was an attempted coup d'état to to remain in power and to keep the the White House. And and you and I have had these conversations before. We're talking to Dinesh D'Souza, vindicating Trump is out on Friday the twenty seventh. How would you address those claims that that January sixth was was him beginning that dictatorial phase? So here's the, here's the question I put directly to Trump, and I, you can see the surprise on his face and the in, interest on his face, and I'll leave it for you to watch the movie to see how he responds. But here's the question. I say to him this. I have looked at everything you said on January 6th, and as far as I can see, you never said, go inside the Capitol, stop the count, take over the building. In other words, you didn't call for an insurrection. And, I, and, and then I add, but if you had, there would have been one. And I say, and there would be one now if you called for one. And I let Trump respond to that. Because what I'm getting at there is not the, so what I think is the sort of simple-minded question, which is, did Trump instigate an insurrection? There was no insurrection. He didn't instigate it. But he does have that kind of power. And I think that gets to the heart of why the left is so terrified of him, and only him. Because they know any other Republican who is facing two criminal indictments, forget about 91, 91 charges, would have fled the field, would be gone, would never be heard from again. So Trump's ability to take this kind of attack and not only endure it, but forge ahead. He somehow manages, he does rope a dope, he somehow, these things don't get him, and he's still standing, and even after the second assassination attempt, he's, you know, what is his reaction? He's annoyed that his golf game is interrupted. He's like, I was about to make an amazing putt. And they're like dragging me off the golf course because there's a man at the next hole trying to kill me. I mean, uh, so you know, nobody up, is like Trump. This is a very birdie. unusual man. Look, if I, as poorly as I golf, if I have a chance for a birdie, I'm going to want to stay on the hole, too. We're talking to Dinesh D'Souza here on the Stats Well, that's, that's called the Trumpian spirit. I try to have a little of it myself. So uh, as you're looking at this perception that, that many people may have of Donald Trump, it is are the people who support him to blame like like the crazies like like cat turd on on social media or or Laura Loomer and Marjorie Taylor Greene Carrie Lake are are they to blame for for some of this perception of Donald Trump? The country is polarized and and Trump didn't cause it. I mean, it's even more accurate to say it caused him, and that has has produced. I will say there are a lot of kooks on on both sides. I mean, anyone who goes to an Antifa rally or even to the Democratic Convention, you can just see the parade of kooks. It's not on one side. It happens to be now on both sides. <laughs> and so, yes, Trump does have some of those people. They are wild, you know, and crazy Trumpsters, if you will. Uh, Reagan had that as well. You know, at one point, someone came up to Reagan and said, well, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, is a, the Ku Klux Klan has endorsed you. Uh, as if to say Reagan should be freaked out. And Reagan goes, well, yeah, but guess what? I haven't endorsed them. So that's the point to keep in mind. You want to judge Trump by what Trump is and says and does, and not necessarily by what some Trumpster does. Dinesh D'Souza here on the Scott Sand Show. The book and the movie, Vindicating Trump. You can learn more at VindicatingTrump.com, including where to see it starting Friday, this Friday the 27th. Uh, Dinesh, in Vindicating Trump, you tell us that you look at the four ways his opponents have tried to assassinate Trump. Of those four ways, and we're talking about character assassination, political assassination, uh, actual assassination, lawfare. Of those four ways, what's been the most dangerous or even the most successful attempt to assassinate Trump? Well, the, the character assassination is how it started. Uh, and then it escalated into the lawfare. And the lawfare is extremely dangerous because the problem is that if it works, then it wrecks the legal system. They will extend it from Trump, then they start doing it to Steve Bannon and Giuliani and, and, and the Trumpsters, uh, and then pretty soon it's open season. You know, this idea of going after someone by finding a politically hostile jurisdiction, picking a jury that already hates you, and then appealing to their prejudices to get them to lock you up, it's a dangerous game, and quite honestly, it's a game you know, that both sides can play. Because, I mean, I live in Texas. Imagine if the attorney general in Texas started indicting prominent Democrats, bringing them into very right-wing counties in Texas, and then getting the people who hate them already to give them long prison terms. I mean, this, is, this would be a breakdown of law and order in this country.
Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, at some point you're going to start to lose elections, and if if uh, you allow the lawfare to happen, then it could be turned against you at some point in the future. On the flip side of, of this entire lawfare argument is the fact that, okay, there may have been some things that he did that, that were uh, against the law, that he broke the law, and nobody should be above the law. Are they... Are they as big a deal as perhaps some of the prosecutors have made them out to be? Most likely not. But if somebody's committed a crime, I want them to pay the consequences. If we're going to be the party of law and order, there should be law and order for members of the party. I agree with that completely, uh, but I would say two things. Number one is that when you are applying a law, you need to apply it even-handedly. You know, I myself was prosecuted for a campaign finance violation, right? right? right. And so the first question I asked to the government there are lots of people who have done what I did, including, say, Rosie O'Donnell. And they've admitted it, but they've never been prosecuted. Why is that? Why are you going after me and not them? So that's the issue of selective prosecution. The second issue is, you know, the problem with, with hitting a guy, and by the way, hitting a guy in the election year with 91 criminal charges is it's so much overkill that you're tempted to dismiss them all. In other words, if somebody had gone to Trump and said, hey, listen, we have a serious violation here. You took these classified documents. You held on to them. We tried to get them back. You dawdled. uh, And so we're going to go after you on a criminal charge. Then I think we'd have to look at the merits. But when you're going after him because, hey, some woman says that he cornered her in the Bergdorf Goodman dressing room. And then over here, he got a bank loan that he paid back. But guess what? He said that Mar-a-Lago was worth a billion dollars, whereas its tax assessment is actually $18 million. I mean, when you start hearing this kind of stuff, then you realize that they're making this stuff up as they go along. They're applying it to only one man. They never apply those rules to anybody else. And so it's clearly a political hit. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with that. But at the same time, there's also no question that Donald Trump, uh, and he, he may have changed his ways lately, has been a womanizer throughout his life. That's, that's evidenced by multiple marriages and affairs. And he's also been a, a shrewd businessman. And as part of being a shrewd businessman, sometimes you, you fudge the numbers a little bit. And, and Donald Trump in his own books have bragged about his business acumen. So there's there's a little bit of smoke to, to a possible fire there. But you're right. When you bring all of these charges, when you wait and hold all of these charges until he announces that he's running for, for the, the presidency again, then it's obvious what, what, what your political motive is. I, I think that's a good way to put it, Scott. I mean, you know, with regard to Trump being a playboy, he certainly was. I think no one's claiming that he's a playboy now. So, the, you know, the worst you can say about him on that score, he's a reformed playboy. All right, I'll admit it. I also admit that he's a massive egotist. But I will argue that in some weird way, I think when you are under the kind of attack that he is, your ego is sort of necessary right. to preserve your identity. I mean, it's almost like Trump's ego is a kind of personal wall that insulates him a little bit from the temperature of, of attacks that would have totally destroyed a normal human being. You got to have thick skin, dude. I'm an I, I have an ego. I'm a little bit of a narcissist to do a radio show every day. I, you, so are you to come on and do these interviews and make these movies? <laughs> You're outing us, Scott. We're trying to keep all this on the down low. <laughs> Dinesh D'Souza here on the Scott Sancho. Vindicating Trump. It's out on, fr- on Friday the 27th. Will there be theaters that will actually show this? You've had such a struggle getting your movies into and, and, and uh, staying in theaters because, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, you're somewhat controversial. Well, I think, you know, Scott, to be honest, uh, after, right in the COVID era, theaters were not in a good way. And so we had we released some of our, couple of our movies by doing theatrical buyouts and so on. But no, this movie is opening normally in theaters. We'll have 800 to 1,000 theaters. There are more theaters going up on the website every day. So vindicatingtrump.com, the cool thing is you just put in your city, you put in your zip code, and boom, all the theaters near you will pop up. And it's not like... It's, it's, it's the normal showings, morning showings, you know, matinee, evening showings. So plan to go opening weekend. It makes a huge difference for a film to see it opening weekend. And this film is made for the theater. So that's the way to see it. Yeah, and, and I, I think it says, sends a signal to, to the media and to, to voters when movies like, like Vindicating Trump or, or just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Am I Racist?, have an economic impact and, and people show up for those, even the Reagan, uh, the, the Reagan movie, I, I think sh- sends a message to the media about what the country really wants to see and hear. 
Yes, and another point, if I can just add, is this, and that is that the theater is a way to do an end run around some of the digital censorship in the media. So they can block me on YouTube. They can try to block me on Facebook. Thank God not on X. But, uh, but the theaters are just a different channel, and so it gives people a chance to get information that way that they may not be getting other ways. We're talking to Dinesh D'Souza here on the Scott Sancho Vindicating Trump. It's out Friday. So uh, in our first segment, uh, Dinesh, you, you said you, it was a long sit-down with Donald Trump. Do you also look at some of the, the facts? Do you lay out the cases you've done in, in other films you've produced, like Obama's America, Hillary's America, Death of a Nation? Do you lay out some of the, the facts that, that, that you and Donald Trump may be talking about? Absolutely. Well, I have a book, and I, in the book, Vindicating Trump, same title, I lay, out it, I lay it out more like a legal argument, with references, with footnotes, the normal way. Movies can't work that way. Movies have to be a story, a narrative, a journey. And so this is a very cinematic, entertaining, moving, and interesting. And the centerpiece of this story is the, the one-on-one with Trump, and, and, and putting things to him that he doesn't often hear from anywhere else. I mean, I discussed, for example, uh, a young Abraham Lincoln made his so-called Lyceum speech, where he talked about the fact that one day America will face a serious threat for, from dictatorship or tyranny. And, and I say to Trump, the left goes, yeah, here we go, here we are, that's you, Trump, you're the dictator. What do you say to that? And, and I have him, you know, you can see his face, you can see his mind going, you can see him reacting, thinking on the spot, relating America now to the America in Lincoln's day. So this is not a normal type of interview with Trump, because to be honest, some of the interviews I've seen, somebody asks a question, Trump speaks for like 15 minutes straight, you know, he just does the Trumpian shtick. You're not going to get that in this movie. No, I, I've, I've interviewed Donald Trump several times on my show as well, and and no two interviews are ever the same, and you never know what answer you're going to get from him. <laughs> That's, that is probably the case. What, I've, what I'm looking for is bringing out dimensions of the man so that you get a rounded picture of Trump. You know, with some people, their public and private face is identical. Uh, I think with Reagan, it was sort of like that. I got to spend some time with Reagan. He's exactly the same in public as he is in private. With Trump, that's not the case. And so bringing out a little bit of that private Trump I think is very valuable for the country to see, what, what, whatever you think of it. I, I know we're almost out, out of time here. We're talking to Dinesh D'Souza, Vindicating Trump. It's out on Friday. So uh, you've spent time with Donald Trump for the last, maybe even before the, the 2016 campaign. But have you known have, there's a lot of questions about his mental acumen these days, much in the same way that, that we were critical and still are of Joe Biden. Have you noticed a decline in, in Donald Trump since 2016 to today? No, what I have seen is, though, a a very interesting change uh, in Trump. And I think it's a change, well, partly, uh, you know, could be produced by by these attacks on Trump and particularly the the assassination attempts. But I think the really big change is this. I think when Trump came in in 2016, he underestimated the, the depth of the corruption in the government. I mean, look. People know that the media is biased, academia is left wing, but no one really knew that the FBI or the CIA, Department of Homeland Security, have been ideologically corrupted in this way, or even that, that the corruption extends to the CDC, the NIH, the, the doctors with lab coats, the people that we've been taught to trust from infancy. Uh, so I think it's created a greater skepticism on the part of many Americans toward the government. And I think Trump has learned that these problems run deeper than even he thought in 2016, which makes him a different man, let's say, going into the Oval Office in 2025. As you look at this corruption, Dinesh, and you talk about this in Vindicating Trump, the, the character assassination, the political assassination, the legal assassination, and the actual physical attempted assassination, uh, meaning death of, of Donald Trump. Is, is all of this part, uh, and, and you know I'm, you know me, and uh, I've been critical of, uh, of some of your facts in the past, I'm not a conspiracy guy, but there's a lot of things that are beginning to add up that, that this looks like it was all planned. Do you think that this is all part of a massive uh, deep state conspiracy to take Donald Trump out and prevent him from taking over the White House again? You know, Scott, look, if you and I sat down, you'd realize we're, we're almost identical on the same page. I'm no more a conspiracy guy than you are, but I also don't accept this idea that 
just by calling someone a conspiracy theorist gets them discredited. Because there are real conspiracies, right? I mean, didn't John Wilkes Booth and his allies organize an actual conspiracy to assassinate Lincoln and the vice president and the secretary of state? That was a conspiracy, not a conspiracy theory, a real conspiracy. Now, let's fast forward to COVID. Anthony Fauci recently admitted that the whole six feet social distancing was not based on science. There was not a single scientific study. It was all made up. And so I asked myself, wow, they went to a lot of trouble to make that up. They went to a lot of trouble to enforce it, to claim the mantle of science. Why would someone do that? Was that just something government just decided to do whimsically? Or could it be that they were like, guess what? The 2020 election is coming up. And, you know, if, if people stand, if, if we vote the normal way, people are going to be standing in line. But what if we were to announce that you've got to be at least six feet apart from the next guy, then normal voting becomes impossible. You've got to do it some other way. Let's have thousands of mail-in drop boxes. Let's change the rules of the election. Let's mail out millions of mail-in ballots. So it's not conspiracy theorizing to ask whether those two things are connected. I believe they are. Dinesh D'Souza here on the Scott Sand Show. VindicatingTrump.com is the website where you can find where to watch the movie. It comes out Friday the 27th, Vindicating Trump, and, and find and follow Dinesh D'Souza on all the social platforms as well. Dinesh, great to have you back on. I'm sure we'll talk after I have a chance to see the movie. Always a pleasure. Look forward to it, Scott.